thank you again uh, to Greg Hager and the conference organizers uh, for the opportunity to speak today. I've uh, called this talk the future of the IECG to diagnose stroke and acute dizziness, uh, telemedicine, tech-based triage and training. And what I'd really like to do in a short 12 minutes is try to tell you a, a complete story. So we'll see whether we can pull that off. Uh, I have the following disclosures, including grant support, some research devices loaned to us by a couple of companies, and I, I care about diagnostic accuracy. I'll also be mentioning the investigational use of the device. I'm going to start with a case, uh, just because that helps ground me and hopefully will help ground you. So 30-year-old healthy man presents with a 24-hour history of continuous vertigo, nausea, vomiting, and gait unsteadiness. He prefers not to move his head. He's made worse by any head movement, including rolling in bed. There are no auditory or neurological symptoms. His gait slightly unsteady, has trouble with tandem walking, is otherwise normal. And he has the following eye findings. He has left beating nystagmus and left gaze, none in primary right gaze, otherwise normal, including normal vestibular reflexes, ocular alignment, and smooth pursuit. How many clinicians do I have in the audience? Just out of curiosity. And um, any emergency physicians? One or two. How many people have ever seen a patient like this? Just out of curiosity. At least a few. Um, so, you know, this is a common problem. There are 4.4 million dizzy patients that come to the emergency department every year. Some of them look like this. And uh, when it's a young patient, typically it's some sort of benign inner ear condition. But in this particular case, this patient had a huge stroke in the back part of the brain. It was larger than a golf ball. It spanned eight sections of his MRI. He was 30. He had no vascular risk factors. And uh, there were subtle things that were clues on his eye exam that he had this stroke, which we'll talk about in a minute. But I just want to tell you that, that this really happens and that the consequences of missing this can be a huge thing for patients. So this is John Michael Knight, who has given me permission to, to tell his story uh, in public. And uh, he's a young man who was a lacrosse player, uh, was headed, he was a high school student, he was headed to, to a a college scholarship, uh, academic and sports, playing lacrosse, and he was playing in his last high school game, an uneventful game, but then in the next day or two, he developed dizziness, nausea, vomiting, unsteady walking, went to the emergency department, was uh, misdiagnosed, was admitted to the hospital, but people didn't realize what was going on. And by the time they figured out what was going on, three days later, he was locked in. Um, I don't know how many people know what being locked in is, but basically it's being trapped inside your own body. Can't talk, can't move your limbs, but you can hear and feel everything and think. And he's gotten back to the point over two years where he's rehabbed to the point where he can move a motorized wheelchair by tilting his head one side and the next. And he still can't talk and he still can't move his limbs. So this is a very real problem for people. So your learning objectives, should you choose to accept them today? One, <clears throat> list criteria for choosing problems that might be solved through technological advances, particularly things that are common, catastrophic, and costly, and have a path towards solutions. Two, to describe how technological solutions can be developed and used to tackle a clinical problem using stroke misdiagnosis as an exemplar. And three, discuss how we should measure the impact of technological advances, including uptake, health, and value. So I'm going to break this up. We're going to talk about choosing a problem, shaping a solution, measuring the impact, and then we'll conclude, and then, then there'll be time for the panel question and answer. So we'll start with choosing a problem. The National Academy of Medicine or Institute of Medicine report released in September of 2015 called Improving Diagnosis in Healthcare highlighted that the delivery of healthcare has proceeded for decades with a blind spot, diagnostic errors. They said most people will experience at least one diagnostic error in their lifetime, sometimes with devastating consequences. And you saw just how devastating those consequences can be. Improving the diagnostic process is not only possible, but it also represents a moral, professional, and public health imperative. And I'll show you how we might have done better for John Michael Knight, but I can tell you that if we diagnosed him up front, we probably could have given him a one-penny aspirin that would have prevented his current health state. So this is a major public health problem. The, the broader issue of diagnostic errors dwarfs all other errors combined. They're clearly the most common, most catastrophic, and most costly of errors. 
They're a little bit difficult to measure. We don't have a great handle on exactly how many there are. Best estimates now suggest there are 12 million a year at least. Four million patients may be harmed because about a third of them are, are harmful and at a cost probably over 100 billion with a B dollars a year. These are the bottom of the iceberg of patient safety and quality, the thing that we've been ignoring for the last 20 years since the release of the Institute of Medicine report in the late 1990s that showed all those uh, lovely jumbo jets dropping out of the sky that was mentioned earlier. It's way bigger than that. So I'm going to tie back to the case throughout. I'll, I'll, I'll call these things base case updates where we um, <clears throat> harken back to John Michael Knight's story and the case that I presented at the beginning. So on the issue of missed strokes, so the, they're, they're what, we, what we call the big three in diagnostic errors. More than half of all the harms from diagnostic errors are attributable to vascular events, infections, and cancers that are missed. Those are the things that kill people, basically, when we don't get the diagnosis right or seriously disable them. Missed stroke is the number one thing that's missed in the, the bucket of uh, vascular events. You compare stroke diagnostic accuracy versus heart attack, we miss about 9% of strokes at first medical contact versus 2% for heart attack. There are probably more than 100,000 missed strokes in TIAs per year, given that there are about 1.25 or so million strokes in TIAs each year in the U.S. And the most important thing to know is that risks rise precipitously with atypical cases. We don't miss strokes when a patient comes in weak on one side and can't talk. We miss patients with stroke who come in with isolated dizziness or headaches or something else that doesn't initially immediately spark attention. And some of that is because it's out of sight and out of mind, and some of it's because it's a signal to noise problem. But symptoms that are milder, transient, or nonspecific are much more likely to be missed. And the harms, although these atypical cases and these essentially milder cases to, pre to present with have lower absolute risk than their counterparts who come in sicker, the relative increase in that risk with our missing them is significant. For instance, it, there's triple the mortality at, at e equal, considering equal grades of subarachnoid hemorrhage, for instance. It's three times the mortality if you miss it the first time as opposed to getting it right the first time. So given the severity, we increase people's risk a lot. This is a, 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 a slide that shows results from two studies that essentially say the same thing, which is that there's a link between, at a population health level, between being seen in the emergency department, told you're just dizzy, a benign inner ear problem, and returning with a stroke inpatient admission within a short time frame, days to weeks. And without getting into all the details, the point is that this is not just one abstract uh, anecdote about a patient who suffered this problem. This is something you can actually measure on a public health scale. There's 180,000 stroke admissions on the left, 30,000 discharges with dizziness on the right, and they show the same thing. Compared to controls, there's this inordinate increased relationship in the time window that's biologically linked to the time window for major stroke following minor stroke or TIA. So we're missing opportunities to diagnose people early and treat them. <clears throat> this translates to about 45,000 to 75,000 missed and probably 15 to 25,000 harmed uh, and disproportionately women and minorities. Uh, increased risk by about 20 to 30 percent and younger patients like John Michael and the patient I presented to you at the beginning. 18 to 44 year olds are seven times more likely to be missed than 75 and over. And that's, again, because it's out of sight and out of mind. It's a lower baseline prevalence and risk. So more, less signal, more noise. All right, so that's the problem. And what I hope you've taken away from that is that when you pick a problem, you should pick a problem that matters. Because then eventually, when whatever solution that you bring to the table is one that's going to have an impact and make a difference. So in shaping a solution, and here we've been sort of talking, dancing around this issue of of computer-based decision support and, and uh, humans being uh, su su supplemented by technology and supported by technology. I think Chuck Friedman's fundamental theorem of in informatics is stated very simply here, which is that we should be looking for solutions that enhance humans, not replace humans. And there are lots of reasons why that, that, that's, that should be the case, but I think at least for the immediate foreseeable future, that's the path to success. For engineering, automation, and technology. So in order to shape a solution for a diagnostic error type problem, 
we have to know something about the causes of diagnostic errors. And it turns out that most of the causes of diagnostic errors are cognitive errors. Now, they occur within a system. The system doesn't always support our cognitive processing. But at the end of the day, most of the diagnostic decisions and the diagnostic errors happen at the bedside in that cognitive reasoning process. There's a, a raging debate in the literature about the importance, the relative importance of cognitive bias and knowledge gaps. And this is relevant because the solutions that you would bring to bear would be different depending on which of these was the primary uh, cause of the problem. And it's turning out that more and more the, the knowledge gaps are really what's driving the bus on this. So let me connect this back to the original problem. And I've mentioned here that we need teamwork, training, technology, and tuning to solve these problems. I'll, I'll describe some of that in a moment. So this is just a base case update. This is a small study that we did uh, in 28 providers, 14 from the emergency department, 14 from primary care, many years ago. And uh, what it shows is a histogram of the results on a 10-question true-false quiz. And then a, a, a roughly normal distribution of what you would expect if people were just guessing. So these were not uh, uninformed people, right? These were, these people performed statistically significantly worse than chance than you would expect based on guessing alone, okay? So these people were informed, they were just misinformed. They were working with the wrong information. This information was broadly found in the medical textbooks and medical literature. We've done surveys of over 500 emergency physicians in the country that show that this is these same conceptions, misconceptions, are highly prevalent. And they, they continue to be prevalent. We've shown instead that there are new mental models that need to be used to diagnose these patients, like John Michael Knight. And without getting into all the details, the focus is on timing, triggers, and targeted exams, and in particular, looking at people's eye movements. We've shown that these here, what we've called hints, these three eye movements, when experts look at them at the bedside, can more accurately differentiate benign inner ear problems from stroke than even an MRI scan, which is our current best gold standard in the acute phase. And what we're doing now, because the number of experts available to do this is just a few dozen in the United States and there are 4.4 million dizzy patients a year, is try to bring that, that expertise to the bedside at scale using technology. So, I'm going to mention to you two particular use cases. One, what I'll call the teledizzy consult service. The other, uh, our avert clinical trial, which is beginning to test automation of the interpretation of these results. And this is just a recording from uh, a patient. In the, the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, you can see a wide-angle view with the patient's head being moved from side to side. In the top left, the moving trace is the orange is the head, the, the green is the eye, and each time the head is moved to the right and to the left, a, uh, that trace is captured and abstracted onto that middle row where you have right and left-sided vestibular reflexes, and then a graph showing those results with the blue X and the red X there, showing that on one side the results are normal and on the other side they're impaired. So this shows a unilateral loss of reflexes of the vestibulo-ocular reflex, the ear-eye balance reflex. And it turns out that this one sign in differentiating strokes from inner ear disease is as good as an MRI. It takes literally two minutes at the bedside, and we can see this all remotely. And when I started seeing this stuff from our clinical trial, I said, you know what, we should just do this now. We don't need to wait five or 10 years for all the automation to work. Let's start getting this out there operationally into clinical practice using telemedicine. So the basic idea is if a patient's dizzy and they're evaluated in the emergency department and somebody thinks this could be an ear problem or a brain problem and they need to figure out between the two, not if they think it's a urinary tract infection, but if they've made that initial judgment that they're going to get a neuroimage or call a neurology consult or send the patient home as a benign ear disease, they just call us instead. And what we're hoping will happen is that we will test the patient's eye movements using the goggles send the results to, for expert interpretation, and then we'll triage the patient. We started doing this in July of this year, and it's going very well so far. And gradually, as we roll this out, 
we'll have more and more hospitals covered. But eventually, in phase two, what we'll be able to do is bring that automation of the interpretation of the results that we're developing as part of our clinical trial back to bear, increasing our capacity and increasing the same, with the same workforce, the ability to go to scale. So that red light and green light decisions will largely just be done through automated work and yellow light decisions will come to us. And that's part of the AVERT trial. So <clears throat> measuring impact. So the question is, when will we get bang for our buck? And there are lots of ways to improve the value equation, <clears throat> but the one that we want is, sorry, the box is in the wrong place, is the value added equation. What we want when we talk about quality over cost is not just to decrease costs. What we really want is better care at lower cost. That's the real winner. And the good thing about diagnosis is if you apply it to a large group of people and you actually make diagnosis better, you're decreasing both false positives and false negatives. And what you end up doing is not only saving some of the patients who's uh, who, who have the strokes that are being missed, but also at the same time decreasing a lot of unnecessary imaging for the much larger group of patients who have benign conditions who are being unnecessarily evaluated. And then we have mechanisms for tracking these. This is a dashboard we developed in c conjunction with the Kaiser Permanente system showing strokes and heart attacks after benign dizziness discharge. And what we want to do is we want to flatten that hump. And once we flatten that hump, I believe will have shown that we have had impact. And we've modeled that we could do this and not only save lives by tackling our high-risk groups, but also save money on our low-risk patients. So in conclusion, pick problems that are common, catastrophic, and costly to society and individual patients. Identify causes and design technology-based solutions within a systems-oriented framework. And measure impact through uptake, actual patient health gains, and value to key stakeholders. And I thank you for your attention.